All right, let us start now. Bismillah, wa alhamdulillah, wa salawat, wa salam ala rasulullah, wa alihi, wa sahbihi, wa min bala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear distinguished, excellent participants, brothers and sisters, it's an honor to have you all with us in this very important and inshallah beneficial session for all of us today. Uh, I'm very honored to have you all here. So thank you for taking your time. Uh, my name is Sayyid Jamaluddin Miri. Uh, I am a licensed counselor from Sweden, also a student of clinical psychology and psychotherapy. I mainly work with uh, Muslim patients, uh, but my main job right now is actually to study. So I'm right now uh, studying uh, Islamic psychology as well. We're very much involved in the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health. So it's an honor to be with all of you. This session today is dedicated to Gaza and Palestine. And we will speak about the current situation on the ground when it comes to mental health. And also we have invited some of the great practitioners and scholars within the field, many of them working on the ground in Gaza and in Palestine. We also invited people from the diaspora, both the Palestinian diaspora, but also generally the Muslim diaspora to get some insights from their perspective uh, to get more know-how of what's happening regarding mental health, both from the people's perspective, how is the mental health situation, but also generally from the practitioner's perspective and the scholar's perspective. And lastly, we also want to find ways to see how can we support all of the initiatives going on on the ground as an international community, uh, as humanity, and as an ummah, inshallah. So this is the main objective. Uh, and uh, please have your microphones unmuted all the time uh, due to the uh, due, due to ma many participants in the session and we have also a, a big panel we will not allow uh, people to ask questions directly on the microphone if you have any questions that you want to address to the panelists feel free to use the zoom chat you will write it there and during the q a's uh, we will uh, collect these questions and we will answer them to the specific person you want to ask or generally to the whole panel inshallah thank you for your consideration we really appreciate it dear brothers and sisters jazakallah khairan I also want to just send my regards to my two uh, wonderful colleagues, uh, honorable colleagues, uh, Sister Dina from Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Sister Mediha from Mauritius. They're both part of the ISIP, International Students of Islamic Psychology. And I want to personally thank you for taking your time to do khidmah. So they will be the ones who will organize the chat. So your questions, they will uh, send them to me. They will also add some information regarding ISIP a couple of times during the session in the chat uh, regarding how you can join, if you're interested, how you can join our WhatsApp groups, inshallah. So they're at your service if it's something to do with administration today. So thank you so much, dear sisters, for taking time. And once more, dear brothers and sisters and participants, it's an honor to have you with us. So let me briefly just introduce the panel and the keynote speakers we have with us. Dr. Yasser Abu Jamai uh, from uh, Gaza is a Palestinian psychiatrist and also director of Gaza Community Mental Health Program. We have uh, Dr. Isra Hisham El Nana. She's a Palestinian general practitioner doctor. We have Dr. Walid Sarhan, psychiatry consultant and editor in chief of the Arab Journal of Psychiatry, Aman Jordan. We have Ustada Rantia Saba. Palestinian clinical therapist with focus on psych psychosocial analysis of the oppressed societies. And last but not least, we have Dr. Omar Rida, Libyan psychiatrist with special interest in man-made and interpersonal trauma. So as you see, we have such an excellent and distinguished uh, panel. So we can all just give digital applause and welcome our wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, panelists to the session. So we give digital applause or we do like this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, all of, you, all of you in the panel for taking your time. It's such an honor to be with all of you. We have met a couple of times before to plan this session. And mashallah, I'm so amazed of all of your knowledge, your insights, and also the important work that you all are doing for our beloved Palestinian brothers and sisters on the ground. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your works, your khidmas, your scholarly work. And really, we are here to support you as an international ummah. And also to thank you and to really honor your work. Jazakallah khairan. So we will start now with a brief uh, presentation. Uh, so I just will give you the participant, the structure of the session today. 
uh, we will start with a brief uh, introduction. I will introduce the organizers, ISIP and al balkhi Institute. Then we will have two keynote speakers. Dr. Omar Rida will speak from his perspective as Libyan psychiatrist working with this interpersonal trauma and man-made trauma. Also, Dr. Walid will speak from his um, psychiatry background. After the two uh, distinguished keynote speakers has done their keynote speak, we will uh, invite the panel, which is Dr. Yasser, Dr. Isra, and Sister Arantia, and they will speak in three different parts. So one part will be how are things on the ground, so we understand the condition on the ground as participants. The next part of the panel session will be, sorry, will be what, what, can, what are people doing connected to mental health services in Gaza and Palestine. And the last part will be how can we as an international community support the work of the professionals in Gaza. And after this, we will give a short summary. Uh, all panelists will have 30 seconds each to summarize. And then we will have 30 minutes Q&A where we uh, will uh, ask all of the questions that you uh, beloved participants have and that you will uh, locate in the chat, inshallah. And last but not least, we will also tell you a little bit of what we are planning for the future as we proceed. We don't want this to only be a session and that's it. We don't want to see it as a happening. We really want to see this as the beginning of perhaps an international movement that will support from a mental health aspect, all the great works that, that are doing in the field and that we listen from the ground perspective. So we know exactly what we can do that will directly benefit because the experts are of course, those who are on the ground in Palestine and in Gaza. So we will discuss a little bit how we can move forward. We're already planning some more sessions, meetings, uh, uniting different organizations, initiatives, because there is a lot of great uh, initiatives and, th and things established in the Ummah from many organizations and individual person. We want to create the umber umbrella where we unite all of these great initiatives and organizations who want to support our beloved Palestinian brothers and sisters uh, connected to mental health. So this is shortly uh, our uh, introduction. I will start now by introducing ISIP and al -Balhi. So, and then we will start with the two keynote speakers. So uh, I come from the ISIP, the International Students of Islamic Psychology. We, we are a, a movement that become, became established about 10 months ago. It's really thanks to the digitalization and the Zoom generation, as we say, alhamdulillah, that we are all connecting. Because you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never put us through a trial without giving us some coping mechanisms. So the pandemic has been a trial for many people. Uh, and uh, many people have felt isolated. You know, we cannot go out. It has been shutdowns and lockdowns. But alhamdulillah, this has also created an opportunity to study from uh, for in different parts of the world. Uh, lectures and sessions that maybe will not be available online before the pandemic is now available. So we are a lot of brothers and sisters who are joining conferences and sessions. And there we started to network and we created WhatsApp groups for Islamic psychology, for resource sharing really, and for connecting and for really being advocates for the indigenous Islamic psychology, which we find uh, uh, as a great tool for healing in the Ummah. So uh, we started the initiative really just by connecting uh, and within 10 months from maybe 50 people who started in one group, we are now 3,500 people from all parts of the Ummah. We have over 20 different groups. We have 80 nationalities represented in our, in our strategic team of ISIP. We have 30 nationalities represented. Our main objective is really to normalize the field of Islamic psychology, build bridges, create networks, be a springboard for those who want to further develop their interests, studies and research or practice within the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health, create halakas, gathering, lectures, seminars such as this, and really be an advocate for mental health in the Ummah. And also be part of how we can break the stigmatization when it comes to speaking about mental health. Because this is actually a stigmatization that exists not only in Muslim countries, also in non-Muslim countries. And we want to be part of you know, breaking that cycle, but also offering tools within our tradition of Islamic knowledge, which could be good for healing. Because Islamic psychology has something that, which is wonderful. It has a holistic aspect. It is holistic, it sees the whole human being, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, compared with some other psychologies, which is very reductionistic, let's speak about behaviorism, for instance, in West, which is very reductionistic. It's almost looking at the human being as a robot, which we are not. The Islamic psychology and these indigenous practices and 
is really a holistic aspect of looking at the human being. And we are a big advocate for holistic aspect. So we are very passionate about Islamic psychology. Um, so if you're interested to join our WhatsApp group, uh, Sister Dina and Sister uh, Mediha, uh, my colleagues will uh, put the link in the Zoom chat for all of you to benefit. And we will welcome all of you to join. We're also about to release a digital library for the field of Islamic psychology, Muslim mental health, free uh, for everybody who is a member of ISIP to benefit from. And we have a lot of plans to also offer courses in the future. We're now going to train our strategic team so we will get Ijaza and the opportunity from the scholars to educate others in the crash and the essences of Islamic psychology, inshallah. This is very shortly about ISIP, and we welcome all of you to join. We also have book clubs, halakas, we have lecture series, readings, to really de deepen our, 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 our knowledge regarding this field. Al-Balkhi Institute, who's also one of the organizers, is a think tank. So we call it Al-Balkhi Institute of Islamic Psychological Studies and Research. This is a think tank dedicating for the normalization of Islamic psychology and speaking about Muslim mental health, both in Muslim countries and non-Muslim countries. We're about 40 people, professionals, scholars, we have practitioners, clinicians, who are jointly working from an interdisciplinary approach to normalize. And we want to do it by creating curriculums, creating sessions, creating dictionaries, translating books into different languages, and really creating joint research as well. So this is uh, Al-Balkhi's Institute's main objective. And ISIP and Al-Balkhi is very much linked together, even though we have some different ambitions and objectives. And also, uh, our plan is also in the future to have physical conferences as well. And we welcome all of you to join. So after the pandemic, we will, uh, inshallah, organize conferences in different countries. So you're all more than welcome to join. We chose Al-Balkhi as a name because Al-Balkhi is the name of Abu Zayd Al-Balkhi, rahimullah. He was the founder. Can you imagine, dear brothers and sisters, every time I think about it, I get so excited. Do you know that the founder of CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, as we see today, was a Muslim scholar from the region of Balkh in modern day North Iran and Afghanistan. Abu Zayd al-Balkhi, rahimullah. He created the CBT thousand years ago. Can you imagine what a rich history we have as Muslims? What a rich history we have in Middle East. And this is for all humanity this knowledge that Abu Zayd al-Balkhi. So maybe in Europe, they started to speak about this 50 years ago, 60, 70, 80 years ago, 1,000 years ago, we had this. So Abu Zayd al-Balkhi became, uh, Rahimullah, became famous for the international community uh, because of the, uh, the translation of um, his book in Arabic into English by the late Professor Malik Badri, Rahimullah. Professor Malik Badri, Badri Rahimullah, he is the founder and the father of modern Islamic psychology. One of the greatest scholars of all time, subhanAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of his work. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant him Jannat al-Firdaus. He passed away two, three months ago and we miss him dearly, but we see ourselves as his really disciples. And also we want to keep his legacy alive and spread it. So that's why we chose for the thing that Abu Zayd al-Balkhi's name to really show respect to our history and also normalize it. And we see that also non-Muslims are interested. They actually in Norway have translated Abu Zayd Balkhi's book into Norwegian. And even them are interested to know more about the historical aspect of Islamic psychology and what we have given in our knowledge resources to the humanity. So even non-Muslims are very interested in this field. So we welcome all to study this. And yes, this is a short presentation. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm sorry that I took a little bit too much time. I'm a very passionate person, please forgive me. So now we go to the, uh, to the, to this uh, keynote speakers. So let me introduce first uh, our first keynote speaker that will speak about um, uh, a little bit about uh, why we are doing this session. He's also part of the ISIP advisory board. He's part of the al balkhi Institute. And I'm very honored to welcome Dr. Omar Rida uh, to this keynote speak. Dr. Omar Rida is a Libyan psychiatrist with special interest in man-made and interpersonal uh, trauma. So please, a round of applause, dear uh, beloved uh, participants, to, to uh, Dr. Omar. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum Barakallahu feekum. Thank you very much. It's such an honor and pleasure. And uh, I, I told Brother Jamal that uh, you know, I really wanted the floor to be given to our beloved uh, Palestinian brothers and sisters, but inshallah, I have a little bit of background uh, working with trauma survivors. I come from Libya, so I worked in that context. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the honor to 
go to the Syrian Turkish border and also to the Burmese and Bangladeshi border. So I came up with a project called Untangled, which uh, aims to break the cycle of uh, dysfunction that we see after trauma. Uh, we see it with individuals, but we also see it with families and we see it with communities. So I'm going to very, very briefly, inshallah, in two minutes, introduce, inshallah, Untangled. Uh, my hope, inshallah, one day I'll be able to visit Gaza, inshallah, and also pray in Al Masjid Al Aqsa together, inshallah. So, Untangled very briefly uh, aims to break the cycles that we see. And when people are traumatized, they might exhibit their you know, trauma in the form of a behavior. If we don't understand the behavior, we might punish that behavior. We have seen trauma break uh, families, break communities. So our aim is to you know, do some psychoeducation in order to uh, tackle the stigma, also train the people on the front lines, uh, provide safe spaces for the community, uh, create culturally humble resources, and also if needed, uh, clinical services in the form of uh, psychotherapy or medication management. So for example, we do uh, parenting workshops in order to give the tools and the skills for parents how to and work with their um, children. I have done some here in the United States, but also this is uh, from a workshop in Cox Bazar, Bangladesh with the Rohingya refugees. We do marriage seminars. We do uh, take children on camps and retreats. And this one we called it on the shoulders of the Prophet والسلام, because Muhammad uh, was a very safe role model. The Sahaba felt very safe to come and climb on his shoulders. They felt valued and validated and respected. So we do the same, inshallah, with our children. This is one of the clinics that we worked uh, in Bangladesh. Alhamdulillah, and out of uh, Untangled, uh, we came up with a number of uh, articles and books. One is about uh, how to take care of the emotional needs of the children, because if we don't provide a safe role model like Muhammad والسلام, they might try to find meaning and identity joining deviant and dark ideologies. And you don't have really to go to a refugee camp to uh, provide healing. You can work within your local community, also starting with your small family. I'm a big family advocate and uh, um, I really, really want everybody, inshallah, to focus on their small family and their immediate community first. And I do that because my mom and dad, and they gave me a very emotionally safe and available childhood. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. I try to do the same for my children. I have three daughters, so together we created, uh, you know, a YouTube channel. We called it the Daughter-Father Bonding Project in order to, inshallah, give the tools that are necessary for fathers to bond with their children, like what Muhammad والسلام, did with his four daughters. And this is a book, Untangled, that I'll be happy, inshallah, to provide a free uh, digital copy as a gift for you, inshallah. The book, uh, The Wounded Healer, is coming up, inshallah, very soon. It's under publication. It has to do with uh, uh, taking care of the caregivers. All of us are wounded healers. We need to practice self-care in order to continue this important work. And I do it again because I lost many family members. I lost my sister, Zakia, for brain cancer. And she was the reason why I pursued medical school. Uh, I lost uh, my nephew, Sadiq, Allah yarhamu. Uh, he was killed by a militant group in Libya in 2014. And uh, very recently, I lost my mom, Allah yarhamha, and she was the reason I do everything that I do. She wanted me to be a source of joy and delight for everybody around me. Inshallah, I try to do this. Uh, and I would love to serve our beloved Palestine in any capacity. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you. Waiyakum, waiyakum. Thank you so much, uh, dear uh, Dr. Omar, for this excellent presentation. We're very honored to have you as part of this panel and your work is very important. So please, uh, dear participants, beloved brothers and sisters, round of digital applause for uh, Dr. Omar. Thank you so much. 
So Dr. Omar will be here at the Q&As as well to support us. And it's an honor to have you as a colleague, Dr. Omar. Thank you so much for your service. We go now to our next keynote speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Valid Sarhan. Dr. Valid Sarhan is a psychiatry consultant and editor-in-chief of the Arab Journal of Psychiatry, Aman Jordan. And Dr. Walid is Palestinian originally. So please, a round of applause to uh, dear Dr. Walid. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a uh, uh, pleasure and honor to talk to this distinguished audience and collaborate with the organizer. Actually, I'm going to state briefly the impact of war on, on Gaza. To start with, we have to put in mind that Gaza wasn't in, uh, in peace and in, in post prosperity before this uh, attack. The blockade was first imposed on Gaza by Israel uh, in 2006. After Hamas won the Palestinian election, it was tightened in 2007 after Hamas took control of Gaza and split from the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Oh, sorry, one minute. The blockade effectively bans nearly all exports from Gaza, severely limits imports to Gaza, and closes Gaza border for exit by Gaza residents and entrance by others. The impact of the blockade has been devastating. The, the, uh, this is talking about before this last attack. Gaza don't have reliable access to clean water, electricity, and many other services. Construction is limited. Hospitals are under-resourced. School systems have been degraded. 7% of Gaza household are food insecure and approximately 80% receive some form of food assistance. Gaza unemployment is over 40%, the highest unemployment rate in the world. Youth unemployment is about 60%. There are power outages of up to 18 hours per day in most areas of Gaza due to fuel shortage and damaged or destroyed electrical infrastructure. 70% of households in Gaza have running water for only six to eight hours once every two or to four week, days. Two years after the end of Operation Protective Edge, over 65,000 Palestinians remained homeless with only 30% of homes destroyed during the attack rebuild. The human aspect of the war on top of this siege, uh, that so far, uh, not, it, the number of deaths is 243, and there is, I think, a little, some 10 more that were discovered later, 66 of them children, uh, 1,900 injured, I think they have exceeded now where this figure and the psychological trauma is beyond measure. The destruction, the United Nations data shows that along some 140 square meters, 459 buildings were destroyed or damaged, some of which were near hospitals, clinics, schools. The United Nations said on May 21st, that six hospitals and 11 clinics were damaged as well as 53 schools. 40 impact craters were detected on roads, which health care providers say impeded efforts to efficient get, efficiently getting those injured to hospitals. Impact on health care, this is what uh, uh, what, uh, what Ellie Sock said, it's completely blocked for the transportation of the patients to the clinic. And the need for, of, a, of a mission for doctors without borders in the Palestinian territories, he is the, heading this uh, mission. And he says it really hindered the access to care. They had to walk to the hospital. Injured people have been to, has, had to be carried to reach the hospital. Financial loss estimated to have 40 million US dollars in industry, 24 million US dollars energy, 27 million dollars 
Agriculture, ANRWA needs, ANRWA is the United Nations uh, agency for the, for the refugee, Palestinian refugees in the whole area. And a lot of them are in Gaza. They are refugees, Palestinian refugees who were displaced from other parts of Palestine in 1984 to, and are staying in Gaza. And so in Gaza, you have about refugee camps in Gaza. They are Palestinians living in Gaza. And they need 33 million plus humanitarian aid. Other financial losses are very difficult to estimate. Political effect. The Palestinian resistance is growing fast. Positive enthusiasm among Palestinians everywhere. All the Palestinians are part of the war and continued uprising. The new generation of Palestinians took over the struggle. This after this attack or during this attack, starting what I believe it's the National Liberation Revolution that will end, that will end the occupation, it's similar to what happened in Algeria when what it, it was liberated from the French. The world the world is realizing the Palestinian problem. Arabs are Muslims are more involved. I hope they will be more and more. The falling of the Zionism is a big issue. That Zionism is, is a fake uh, idea and the uh, existence of uh, the state of Israel in this land is never going to succeed because this land is Palestine, which should be for the Palestinian, nobody else. What are the needs? We need to continue the world campaign for Palestine. We shouldn't forget the story after the news stops and the bomb bombing, although it has never stopped. Yesterday, before yesterday, there were, there were small little attacks here and there and people were injured. And this is also happening in other parts of Palestine. In, in, in Jerusalem and Ramallah and even in the Palestine, Palestinian lands that are occupied in 1984-48. Support the Palestinians in every way possible. Put pressure on Western world to be fair. Construction of Gaza. Medical help for Palestine and especially Gaza. Open the economic activities. In the siege, ending the siege should have been a priority long time ago. What psychological support I am, I believe we need. The, there should be an they sh it should be organized with mental health care in Gaza. Gaza is not empty. We have a lot of colleagues there who are ready to organize matter. Because you know, in such situation, when many agencies will come in and individuals, things uh, don't go in the right direction. The rest of Palestine is a source of help. Arab mental health professionals can help through a good online platform. Training and education of many graduates of psychology in Gaza. There are thousands of graduates of psychology in Gaza you know, but they need training and uh, further uh, education. Unqualified people could help by other means. Thank you very much for listening. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Wali. Uh, thank you so much for this beneficial keynote speak and presentation and for giving us some more insights regarding how we can support as uh, uh, as uh, brothers and sisters of the Palestinian people. Thank you so much for giving us this keynote speak. Please, dear participants, round of applause to our beloved Dr. Walid. Thank you. So with, uh, with that said, Dr. Walid and Dr. Uh, Omar has given us a nice and very beneficial introduction to the panel. And we are very honored to have these two uh, very knowledgeable practitioners with us. Thank you once more, Dr. Walid and Dr. Omar. May Allah always put the barakah upon your great works, inshallah. So now we go to our panel, dear brothers and sisters and 
excellent participants from all parts of the Ummah and the world. Uh, you're all welcome. Uh, so we have first Dr. Yasser Abu Jamai, Palestinian psychiatrist, director of Gaza Community Mental Health Program. We have Dr. Isra Hisham Ernana, Palestinian general practitioner doctor. And last but not least, we have Ustad Arantia Saba, Palestinian clinical therapist with focus on psychosocial analysis of the oppressed societies. So round of applause, my dear brothers and sisters and excellent participants. Uh, so we have in, in, in the participant group, we have people from all parts of the world and Ummah, so we hope that this will be beneficial for all of us to listen to. And please add your questions in the chat so that we will uh, ask them at the end of the session during the Q&As. And also thank to all of you to part that are participating. We know we have a lot of great organizations in Indonesia and UK and US that are also here with us. And we support your works within the field of Muslim mental health and Islamic psychology. Thank you so much for your services and works. So we start with part one of our uh, session and panel discussion. The question that I want to ask uh, to our panelists is, how are things on the ground? and also a little bit about the condition on the ground with focus on mental health. This is the first question, because I think that for us as non-Palestinians and not being in the ground, even though we feel with Palestine and Palestine is part of our hearts, uh, we need to know what is happening on the ground so we can be more aware and educate our local communities and find ways to support. So please, Dr. Yasser, feel free to speak about this. And when you're done, I will invite Sister Antia and Dr. Isra as well. Welcome, Dr. Yasser. The floor is yours. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Thank you very much, uh, Brother Said. Let me begin by thanking all the uh, organizers, the panelists, and of course, the attendees. And uh, I'd like to begin my talk with uh, sharing just a couple of slides. Uh, this is the first one, which uh, I think already Dr. Walid mentioned which is like after each uh, you know, problem or difficulty or attack or something like that, people look at how many people were affected, you know, like figures, numbers. Of course, we know that uh, more than 250 people got killed and more than 1,900 uh, people got injured. Among the people who got killed were uh, 66 uh, girls, including, uh, sorry, uh, children, including 23 girls and 43 boys, and 38 women, including four pregnant women, they, they got killed. Another issue that we looked at is about the destruction. And here I have limited my talk to the most things that affect the people, which is the housing. So almost 17,000 uh, housing units were affected, including 1,000 that were totally destroyed and another 1,000 that were severely damaged. We speak about 2,000, a little bit more than 2,000 buildings or sorry, housing units that are not inhabitable any uh, more. Uh, during the attack also, the 11 days attacks, the people uh, were internally displaced, which means that they had to leave their homes. At the peak of it, more than 100,000 people uh, left their houses. However, you know, as we speak of today about like uh, 9,000, 10,000 people are not able to return to their houses for simple reason, which is that their residencies, their houses uh, or, or housing units are not there anymore. They are waiting destruction. You know? uh, sorry. Uh, reconstruction uh, but to say it all let's let's look at the most important figure the most important uh, thing that we need to keep in mind while talking about the mental health this is a small uh, uh, map that shows as a strip and you see all various kinds of uh, sorry of, of, of squares you know and those squares look like uh, uh, some of them are uh, green, some of them are uh, red, some of them are uh, uh, orange, but these are all that show the areas that were targeted during the 11 days attacks. Now let's remember that this area in width, which is about like 10 kilometers to 14 kilometers maximum, so six to 10 miles perhaps uh, maximum. The length of Gaza Strip is just about 40 kilometers. Now, these are not inhabitable areas, but look at this. This is the main area of Gaza City and the northern area of Gaza City. 
when you see here about the Khan Yunus area and then the Rafah area, which are the mostly densely uh, populated areas in, in, in Gaza Strip. In Gaza Strip, we have more than 2.2 million people who live in 365 uh, square kilometers, more than 5,000 people per square kilometer. So let's keep those figures in our minds and look at the areas that were bumped, that, that were bumped you know. The, the, the very red one, there were the extreme bombardments. Unfortunately, some of the areas that were bombed were towers, you know. And uh, I like all the time to speak or to show this uh, map, which is, by the way, produced by international agency that's showing the damage, to understand the intensity of the bombardment, the severity of the bombardment. Because when we compare it to, to, to previous uh, attacks, you know, because people like to, to compare things, you know, we see that the number of casualties is a little bit lower. But when we speak about the psychological impact, this time it's really a lot, a lot, a lot higher. First, because the severity of the bombardment, the locations, that is almost every place. And then the areas that used to be, let me say, uh, relatively safe, which is the Western areas of Gaza Strip, you know, that they used to be the shelter for people who were running from the very eastern areas, you know, towards the safe place, the very northern areas towards the safe place, that area was not anymore safe because we heard the bombardment. No one really felt safe this time. Again, um, another of, uh, couple of uh, examples actually that really show that people knew that no one is really safe is this famous, very famous story that too, our prominent physicians passed away during the, the, the 11 days attacks, just being at home. Dr. Ayman Abu off to your left, who is the head of uh, uh, internal uh, uh, medicine unit at the Shifa Hospital, the biggest hospital in Gaza Strip, who was in charge, by the way, of the COVID-19 uh, uh, management. And on the right, Dr. Muayn Abu, uh, uh, Dr. Muayn Al Alul who is a colleague of mine, who is a psychiatrist, who used to, a retired actually psychiatrist, who used to be uh, working at the uh, 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 psychiatric hospital in Gaza uh, City. So these two people were killed when they were just staying at home. You know, Dr. Ayman was just returning. An hour earlier, he was just returning back to his home from his um, hospital, just to going home to get himself prepared for another day. But unfortunately, that day never happened, you know, with Dr. Ayman, uh, uh, not only him, but uh, I think three or four members of his, of his family passed away with him. We speak about uh, 17 families with more than three people who got killed during those attacks. I think some six or seven families that were not, they are not there anymore in the registrar, which means that all of those people were just, they just passed away. So, uh, uh, sometimes, again, we, we, we like to compare things to 2014 attacks, 2012, 2008, but this is not the, the idea of showing these uh, figures, but the idea is that any child who is now 16 or 17 years old have already witnessed four, perhaps, large-scale offensives on Gaza Strip since 2008, 2012, and then 2014, each one of them with the number of killed people, with the number of injured people, and when you look at the children, in each time, you find about 30% of the people who got killed or wounded are basically children. About 20 to 25% are basically uh, women. And these figures continue to, to, to speak for themselves. Not only those three attacks, but you know, a couple of years ago, three years ago, when we Palestinians felt that fed up, believe there is a need to change things, and then the great demonstrations to return started to speak about more than 20,000 people who got uh, uh, injured. So when we speak about anyone who is, who is simply, uh, 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 let me say, uh, who, who is simply uh, uh, suffering at the moment, the suffering is not only because of the recent attacks, but because those recent attacks bring up some other memories, you know. That's why we all the time kept it during the attack, hearing the large bombardment and thinking whether this is going to be another one like 2014 or it's more than 2014. And it's unfortunately more than 2014 when it comes to the fear to the psychological impact. Children during the days of attacks, very simple, clinging to their parents. Children were all the time extremely afraid, fearful. They know that there is no place to, to uh, hide uh, all the time, showing, you know, putting their hands on their ears when they start just hearing the airplanes. And 
then various pains, you know, pains with the abdomen, pains with the knees, pains with the knees, the ankles, sometimes vomiting, something like uh, that. And then started to show some bedwetting and some night terrors and nightmares. When it comes to adults, there was always a sense of, of which is the most difficult sense, was the sense of being hopeless, you know, and helpless. You cannot really offer anyone of your children or any family member the sense of being just safe, of being just secure. How can you provide them a sense of security or safety when you continuously hear the bombardment for 25 to 30 minutes? How can you tell your child it's safe while you hear the bombardment? It doesn't work like that, you know. You cannot lie to your children to understand how things are. Right? So, so this is one of the most fearful things. The other thing is that for like 11 days, most of the adults looking around their children, and children, of course, the lack of sleep, you know. And that's why until now, many people, especially adults, not only talk about some various pains in their, their, their body, but also about the feeling of dizziness, you know, somnolence, that they need more sleep, that they still have problems with concentration, that they still have some issues with uh, when it comes to, you know, to just... Uh, catching up with things like, you know, like memory, you know, something is wrong. We are not as we used to be. Some of them say that we are, in a, we feel like we are in a dream. And this is the general uh, uh, symptoms, but there are the mostly affected people. And you speak about very severe symptoms, symptoms of dissociations. You know, some people have acute trauma responses and they have acute stress disorder, while others have really severe uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, so, so this is in uh, in, in general the uh, 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 the uh, the kind of symptoms. One of the interesting things that I would like also to add this time that the people start bringing their you know it's it's a little bit different from previous time. They they come and bring their you know adolescent children. Speak about boys or girls who are like 15, 16, 17, and you feel like they are the most affected. Were they the most affected? Were they simply, you know, all the time thinking about the previous attacks? Uh, I'm not sure about that. We need a lot of research to do that. And, and finally, the thing that is most important, now it's, it's three weeks already, alhamdulillah, passed since the ceasefire. Three weeks. And the, the issue is, is uh, uh, no, almost one month, by the way, four weeks. The issue is that until now, we still hear the bombardment, as Dr. Walid said, every now and then. Two nights ago, we had like three large explosions that were heard here and there. The drones are filling the sky, so, so you can never really feel that it's safe. And we all the time say that in order to rebuild your you know, uh, uh, resilience to overcome the trauma, you need some feeling of safety that you can really allow natural healing processes, the intervention when it comes to psychological intervention or uh, psychiatric intervention, etc., etc. So you need some, some peace. Unfortunately, that peace is not yet uh, uh, there. And fortunately, the borders that were closed during the attacks are not open back. I speak about borders that allow, uh, uh, let me say, goods to come into Gaza Strip. You know? And this is again another uh, uh, difficulty. So all in all, we are we are waiting for, for a change, but, but all in all, things are still as difficult as they were. We, as previous times, expect the wars to come in the future, because in the very first weeks, after the such attacks, people they just look at try to gather themselves, you know, try to uh, 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 go on with their lives one way or the other. But the psychological implications show a little bit later. And on the other hand, this comes because many people try some other interventions, and when they just find out that they need to go to a mental health therapist, then it gets us a little bit late. So thank you very much, and I'll give the floor to my other uh, colleagues. Salam alaikum. Jazakallah khairan, uh, Ustad Dr. Yasser. Round of applause for Ustad Dr. Yasser, mashallah. Uh, you're doing an amazing job on the field, and I think I speak for the whole international community here that we are really appreciated of all the works, and also it's not an easy work you guys are doing, and may Allah uh, accept your work, and may Allah always put tawfiq, and uh, I'm also sad to hear about your colleagues, and of course so many uh, distinguished brothers and sisters who, who passed away in this recent attacks and this recent aggressive oppression, terrorist attacks towards the Gaza people. So we ask Allah to grant them jinnat al-fudas, Allah, inshallah, and we will make their 
um, work never gets uh, uh, lost. We will always remind them and their great works and their sacrifices for the humanity that they have done. Thank you so much. Please, round of applause, dear brothers and sisters, participants to, to this first session. Let me now uh, go to our next uh, panelist. Uh, is it it's still the same question? We're still in part one. How are things on the ground? So Dr. Yasser spoke a little bit about it, also spoke about the fear, the different traumas that people are facing. So now we welcome uh, Sister uh, Rantia Sabah. She's a Palestinian clinical therapist who focus in our work on psychosocial analysis of the oppressed societies. We have had several discussions. I'm very inspired by Sister Antia's work. So she will speak a little bit more about normalization of oppression and how that affects psychologically, the psychological impact. Also a little bit from the perspective of Sheikh Jarrah in Al-Quds, Jerusalem, and also Gaza, and specifically in West Bank where uh, Ustad Arantia is working. And she will also speak about the holistic approach regarding Palestine as a large. So please, dear brothers and sisters, an excellent participant, round of applause to Ustara Rantia. The floor is yours. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much. Hello, and thank you, Brother Sayyid. Thank you, everyone and the panelists for being here with us today. So I would like to start my speech today with a story that made me consider what, um, sorry, reconsider what mental health means in Palestine and for me in hopes to make it clearer and closer to understanding the situation, specifically from my personal experience during the last events in May in the West Banks. During the month of May this year, Palestine has made the headlines worldwide, and it started from Sheikh Jarrah to Jerusalem Al-Aqsa, then on to the vicious Israeli aggression on Gaza. Many therapists have used their platforms to try and assist Palestinians and supporters in ways to cope with what's happening. And I was looking personally for comfort and tips on how to balance during all of what was happening so I can recharge my energy and keep going. So I came up upon an Arab therapist that has given her input on the topic on how to deal with stress during these events. And she said a sentence that really triggered many thoughts I had. She said, you don't need to participate in any way during these events if your energy doesn't allow it, even in following up with the news because you need to take care of yourself and your mental health. And this is the top priority. At the end, you will burn out if you don't. So many can agree with what she said, but what stood out for me was her words exactly, is the Eurocentric domination on the definition of what mental health is like and how we should reach it. We can notice the privilege in disconnecting and detaching oneself from the scenery in order to protect ourselves from the outside reality. The problem with the Eurocentric definition of mental health or mental well-being is the absolute detachment of the individual from the group, as if well-being of the individual can mostly be obtained separately from the context and from the group. So the process of therapy starts by focusing on ways of coping with the personal elements of this individual in order to reach the fullest and most fruitful abilities that can contribute to the community, disregarding the suppressive system and structure this individual lives in. This is so similar as well to the definition of the World Health Organization on mental health. It exactly defines it as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own abilities and then can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make contribution to his or her community. This definition can be true to many individuals and community, but it also dismisses the context and environment many others live in, one of which is the Palestinian context. The Palestinians are born with a clear political identity, they're viewed as political objects, and thus their very being is politicized. Their very existence is discussed in a political way and are used as tools that affect the society as a whole. The Palestinians are born politicized and political, and their very being is political itself, meaning their very existence in discussed, is discussed in a political way that affects the rest of the society. So Palestinians grow up bearing the burdens of their ancestors' history, the future of their children, and bearing a clear answer to imaginary questions 
and with an analytical thought stemming from an environment full of political, classist, and social violence, making the Palestinian individual carry several identities in one life, and thus having the Palestinian psyche drastically affected and transformative in connection to its environment. So continuing to connect mental health in Palestine with only media covered escalation of aggression from the occupation is very condescending view on Palestinians, where our mental health and humanity is reduced and being constantly connected to violence. Many believe that the Palestinian mental health is negatively affected, mostly when there is a direct violent aggression and major events happening towards them. But in reality, the most aggressive form of violence Palestinian has been living under is the calmness phase. The calmness is usually believed to offer mental ability, stability, the quietness. But in the Palestinian context, calmness is the submission to the status quo and the status quo is by definition in Palestine is a violent one. So calmness in this is a phase where the violence and oppression are systemically turned into a social structure and then oppression is normalized. It becomes a part of the life we live in. So in this phase that Palestinian have been living under for many years now, we notice the slow insertion of the day-to-day -day oppression in the psyche of the Palestinians and then the development of coping mechanisms as protection tools and as a reflex to the context. So after this violent structure is embedded in our lives, naturally we try and cope with it to continue living and fighting. We become passive elements in issues that tremendously affect us and eventually disregard our mental health and disorders as secondary factors against what we face and against our cause, causing us further to develop some disorders that are deeply rooted in this context itself. Well, until recently, until a social uprising occurs containing a very direct form of violence that one cannot detach oneself from it and thus letting go of these coping mechanisms and regaining the agency in this vicious context we live in. We reform and we regain our previous roles that were purposefully put aside to maintain an aggressive status quo. This happened during the last events in Palestine, where we saw collective efforts in fighting the status quo of a colonialist and apartheid system called the Israeli occupation. This form of violence, specifically like the last one, has limited the already limited options we have in our lives and the life under the status quo. So that unsurprisingly, the passive roles that we used to hold on to and the coping mechanisms has fallen down and the agency of the individual, the Palestinian individual within the collective has been reactivated. What happened is that this collective fight gave meaning to the individual roles of Palestinians the spaces became wider, the voices became louder, and the psyche became definitely healthier. Because regaining the agency in your life literally means regaining the control in your own life, or at least trying to, which is exactly what was missing in the lives of Palestinian all these past years of calmness. As the World Health Organization defined it, we did realize our own abilities and truly started working productively and fruitfully towards our lives and freedom, and eventually leading us to actually contributing to our community in every shape and form of resistance. So as we can see, mental health is not only for Palestinians, but every nation and people who are under oppressive systems and oppression, resistance is an integral part of their well-being. So let's start and look differently from now on, on what is exactly the meaning and the definition of well-being and how to take care of it in a context like the Palestinian one. Thank you. Zakala Khairan, Sister Ustada Rantia, mashallah, round of applause. What a, what a speech, mashallah. Thank you so much for clarifying that. And also to mention about the impact of oppression, of settler colonialism, you know, how that affects the human psyche. It's very interesting. I caught the Eurocentric dominance and how that, and those perspectives in mental health, how, do that, how does that affect us? Importance of decolonialize 
what we speak about when we speak about mental health. You spoke about a lot of great things, the intergenerational trauma. So thank you. I, I, I think I speak for the whole audience. That this was a great, great introduction. Jazakallah khairan once more. Thank you for your great work, sister. So once more, a, a round of applause. And let me now introduce our last panelist who also will give a short presentation of the current situation related to the health situation in Palestine. So let us all welcome Dr. Isra Hisham Elana, Palestinian general practitioner doctor. A round of applause, dear brothers and sisters, and the floor is yours. Welcome, Dr. Isra. Okay, salam alaikum. It's an honor to have you actually. Um, so for today, I will show you the latest WHO report about um, a Palestinian, a current situation of impact uh, and impact of health sector in Palestine and in Gaza especially, and we will specialize on the mental health. Okay, so to start with, actually we all know that the violation or the violence nowadays is increasing in Palestine in general and in Gaza in specific, okay? And in addition to the COVID-19 that we, 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 we cover, we saw in 2020 and 2021, actually it's a very, it's, it's, things are going worse and worse in Palestine. And as we know that there is, and there is substantial numbers of fatalities and casualties uh, placing considerable strain in a health system that, as we said, actually overwhelmed of COVID-19. In Gaza, uh, struck the function of healthcare system actually uh, have been affected by many damage of buildings, like Dr. Yasser said, and many health facilities and, uh, and essential infrastructures. There is also a destruction in water sanitation structure uh, with a displacement for uh, 7,000 Palestinian that they seek shelters uh, in UNRWA schools destruction. So these um, actually difficulties in living and difficulties to have water and the life needs maybe uh, present a hygiene uh, difficulty and actually living, limit the physical distancing measure, measures for effectiveness uh, COVID-19 prevention. In West Bank, uh, also there was an urgent need to support the emergency health uh, care provision, okay, including uh, supplying more medicines, disposables, and equipment, uh, because as we know that West Bank is also facing difficulties in from mil Israel militaries. Okay, going through the mental health in a specific re regarding to mental health consequences, actually, as we know that all Gaza uh, citizens expose violence, loss of families and lo loved ones have many lacking control of worsening poverty, unemployment, insecurity, and so on. Okay, so um, actually these all situation are increasing the mental health diseases and mental health uh, um, uh, patients in Gaza. Okay, so WHO recorded that there is like 200,000 people, uh, okay, or more one in 10 people suffering severe mental or moderate uh, mental health diseases here in Gaza from uh, 2021. Okay, so actually WHO respond to that and develop many emergency responses plan to reduce the mortality and morbidity, to increase the awareness of mental health and to have an inter more intervention activities and uh, increase uh, actually first aid, uh, um, first aid um, uh, access and to have many essential health services for uh, these people, okay? Uh, and actually it focuses on four areas related to health. First, it uh, 
it concentrate more uh, about the trauma and emergency care. It actually concentrate on mental health and psychological support uh, by, as we said, by increasing and providing the psychological mental health to increase healthcare worker and have many a more awareness to conduct the and need of assessment for the provider of mental health worker and um, uh, who, 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 who give the mental health and to increase to health uh, care services. They also actually uh, concentrate on advocacy way and also they maintain the access of essential health care services in, uh, in general, especially the COVID-19 uh, side. Okay, so that was the actually the report of the WHO. Um, I hope that it gives you some information about the whole uh, situation. Uh, thank you for listening. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Isra. Uh, thank you so much for this very beneficial presentation to get more insights regarding the situation on the ground. Uh, I think I say to the rest of the group that we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Round of applause to Dr. Istan for her great works she's doing. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you all with us. So now we go to the next part, which is part two. And this is more a question that I want to ask, particularly to Dr. Yasser and Dr. Isra, regarding what are people doing connected to the mental health services in Palestine? And specifically, if you could highlight the services in Gaza, but generally whole Palestine as well, available services and resources. I already heard that you have mentioned this in your presentations, but if we can go a little bit more thorough into it, I think that will be very beneficial for, for all of us uh, from the uh, international community, inshallah. So we start with you, Dr. Yasser. The floor is yours. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well, I, I'd like to share um, a slide that shows the main, uh, let me say that what we call the pyramid of intervention that everyone looks at uh, in times of crisis. So when we speak about four levels of intervention, we begin with the very basic things, which are like, you know, considerations and basic services and, and security we speak about, you know, dignity of the people, location, that they, they, they have basic services, food, uh, hygiene, kits, etc., etc., And we, we move upward towards like some sort of psycho, uh, social support, you know, some uh, 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 child-friendly spaces, and then to counseling, and we end up with the tip of the pyramid where we have specialized services or it's psychotherapy and mental health uh, uh, or psychiatric interventions. So when we speak about those four levels, and in Gaza Strip, we see only uh, two organizations that work at or provide the psychiatric services, which is the Ministry of Health. Uh, with its one psychiatric hospital, we speak about only one psychiatric hospital that has, I think, 30 beds in a population that serves a population of 2 million people. So you can imagine how this is underestimated. Uh, I mean, uh, 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 and the needs are extremely not met. And when we speak about mental health services, about community mental health centers, we speak about nine centers, three that belong to GCMHP, the organization I work for, and six that belong to the Ministry of Health. So we speak mainly about uh, uh, those two entities that provide specialized services, which is the uh, organization and the uh, Ministry of Health. And then we have many organizations that work at the second level, which is like, you know, uh, uh, non-specialized support, like counseling, some sort of uh, group meetings, et cetera. We have many local uh, NGOs. And then when we speak about the uh, uh, lesser uh, uh, specialized services, we have many local and uh, international NGOs. And the, the thing that we are always interested in, and I think it's important for people to, he to hear this, that when we started in 1990, we understood that it's not only about therapy, you know, that you need also to do some other work. That's why we have three areas of work that we, are, we try our best to work with, which is not only research, not only sorry, therapy or intervention, but also we need to couple it with research and we need also to add to that capacity building. Capacity building, we talk about various training workshops, training programs that we try to educate uh, uh, and train and make people more skillful 
whether those people are our own stuff or the other stuff that work in the uh, Gaza Strip. I speak only about Gaza Strip because, of course, because of the occupation and the blockade, we were able to physically work only within Gaza Strip throughout 30 years of, of, of work. Uh, for example, when, when we worked with in, in the year 2020, we, we have presented services to more than 16,000 people, but the direct beneficiaries who were patients, let me say about 3,177 uh, uh, patients. It's important to say that the uh, services that we pro provide need to be a comprehensive service, which means to be able not only to provide to adults, but also to children, not only to adults, to men, but also to women. And, and this uh, picture comes from one of our three community centers it's our play therapy room when we see a therapist, a colleague of mine, a psychologist working with a young uh, uh, child. This photo was taken, by the way, uh, or this picture was taken, by the way, about two months before now. So it's not for uh, a child who, were really, who was really attacked by the, or, or suffered from the recent uh, uh, attacks. Uh, one of the main things that we try to do all the time working with the community is all the time to uh, uh, change the... Uh, uh, let me say, uh, uh, not only the feelings, but the understanding, the cognition of people around us. So when we talk to children, you would like to make the children happy again. You need to make the children feel safe again. You need to make children think about their future. You, know, you need to make children overcome the difficulties with concentration and perform better with the uh, uh, schooling. And this is something that you cannot achieve alone without the help of um, uh, families. That's why you need all the time uh, 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 some sort of uh, engagement by the family and engagement by the therapist um, uh, also. It's also very important to say that um, uh, the uh, sector at large, mental health sector in Gaza Strip is very uh, in need for a lot of, uh, of work, for a lot of support. Uh, a good example of that, we have more than 3,500 psychologists who are graduates but they do not have a workplace. They do not go to any place to work uh, with. The number of uh, people who work in the mental health profession in, in the whole Gaza Strip, whether in the Ministry of Health or in GCMHP, are less than 200 people or about 200 people. So imagine 200 people are providing the mental health services to about 2 million people. So the, the, the needs are huge, demands are huge. However, the, the resources that are needed are very uh, scars, but I think we can talk about this uh, a little bit later when we speak about what uh, other things that could be done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasser, for a terrific presentation. I think I speak for all group. We got more view regarding how is the, how much services is it in Gaza? Uh, and uh, as you say, it's under diminished, like 200 for a population of 2 million. It's not, it's not much. So it, it's under the uh, dimensioned, and this is good for us to know how we can support your great work, inshallah. Uh, so thank you so much. Round of applause to Dr. Yasser for this uh, important uh, presentation. Uh, so yes, there is just briefly, there's a lot of questions regarding the, 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 the session, if we will upload it on YouTube. Yes, in a couple of days, we will upload this session on YouTube. We will share the YouTube link in our WhatsApp group. So if you join our WhatsApp group, we will uh, get, get that information. Also, we will ask all of the panelists if they would like to share their PowerPoint slides. And if they give us that permission, we will also share it in the WhatsApp group so you can benefit from it. Uh, I also want to thank Do uh, Brother Bill Slaughter. He just wrote uh, the link to Dr. Yasser's organization in the Zoom chat. Thank yeah. you, uh, Brother Bill, for your great work, by the way. You're doing no, baby, job come as advocate. So, uh, if you want to see more about uh, Dr. Yasser's organization, their work, uh, look at gcmhp.ps. Sister Arantia has also shared her Twitter account if you want to follow her and see her works. We will also share uh, all of their works in our WhatsApp groups, of course, so you all can benefit, inshallah. And I also see that you shared some resources in the, what, in the Zoom chat. All of these we will also share, inshallah. Barakallahu feek. So, uh, Dr. Isra, I will ask you the same question as I asked uh, Dr. Yasser. Uh, what are people doing connected to mental health services in Palestine? You highlighted it some, but please, if you would like to specify a, a little bit more, it will be an honor for us to, 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 to benefit from your vast amount of experience and expertise. Welcome to the stage again. The floor is on, uh, yours. Round of applause, dear brothers and sisters. Yeah, okay. 
So I'll try to share something. Okay. So actually, Dr. Esther said very good uh, about all of that, but I will uh, actually uh, said more about, I will um, talk about a review of mental health here in in and psychological need in Gaza and in Palestine. I will start by showing a mental health system here in Palestine at, uh, in general. Then I will talk slightly about with mental health services that are given uh, and going into the how we how the uh, mental health is being financed and then the human resources regarding to mental health. Uh, I will talk about the uh, research and the monitoring after that, I will talk about the stigma of the mental health. And lastly, I will set some recommendations that can help. Okay, so to start with, if we were going to talk about the health system in Palestine, as Dr. Yasser uh, said that we have a governmental and a non-governmental field. The governmental, I mean the Ministry of Health and the hospitals, the military and governmental hospitals, while as the non-governmental means the UNRWA, the NGOs and the private clinics and hospitals. Okay. Okay, regarding to mental health services, actually the most services are given and uh, from the Ministry of Health, from the primary healthcare centers. Okay, there are secondary healthcare centers giving um, these services, but actually we have only two hospitals in Palestine, one in Bethlehem and others in Gaza. Okay, regarding to financial mental uh, system services, Actually, there is, regarding to WHO uh, AIM report, there, there is no specific budget for mental health itself, but there is a 2% two, two, uh, expenditure of the whole health is given to the mental health in specific, okay? 73% of this 2% uh, uh, two uh, is given to a mental health and psychiatric hospitals, okay? Um, as for the human resources mental health, as we see in the diagram, the most actually um, the most human resources covering the mental health is nurses. Okay, then coming the psychiatrist and the social worker and the uh, psychologist. So actually, uh, as a doctor, I can see that there is a very low numbers of psychiatrists as uh, compared to what is needed here in Palestine. Okay, so we can say that, that there is like um, in the in the final report of the Man Minister of Health, they said that there is a 43 psychiatry in, in, in all Palestine. One of them is a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Going through the research and the monitoring field, actually, we, we can predict that there is a very, um, actually, a very uh, low researches and services is given to mental health, uh, especially the qualitative researches. And uh, we can predict that these researches in specific needs, many services need, many efforts need, many information, and all these is not available here in Palestine. Okay, so, okay. Okay, going to that picture, actually I was reading about the UNICEF uh, the humanitarian needs, uh, Palestinian needs, and how Palestinian can be affected by Israeli military. Okay, as we see here in the figure the, that there is like 2 million people are affected by uh, Israeli military in uh, 2019. Okay, but the most important point that the second part, like 500, uh, 500,000 people need psychological and mental health services. Here's in the figure, actually, there was a comparison between the child uh, needs and the um, actual psychological and mental health uh, uh, need is given for the children in West Bank and Gaza, and as we actually notice that the red, uh, the red, um, the red one, is, we can see that it's the what is presented, and the uh, blue one that is the actual, actually mental health need uh, to be given. 
Okay, so this big gap, we can predict that this is gap because of many reasons. I think that one of them is what is called mental health stigma. stigma. Okay, we all know actually that there is a stigma related to mental health globally, internationally. We can understand that, but regarding to Palestinian situation, that there is a double stigma because that there is, as we all know, that there is no awareness uh, regarding to mental health, in addition to political and economical barriers that uh, Israel uh, military is actually uh, give to, to that. In addition to that, I, I can add that point. We can say that the psychological patient and for example, one who has depression or who has a psychological disease in Palestine, actually he's he's named as crazy or he's not actually normal. Okay, so all these factors, in addition to religious point, we can set. So all these factors actually increasing that difficulty to enter and to have um, that um, actually a comfort zone for the mental health to work in. Okay, so lastly, actually, my recommendation is to develop that mental health services by strengthening the mental health staff members. That's the first point. Secondly, the awareness of stigma is too important, it's very important to the mental health worker and to citizens also. The third point, actually, to get some effort uh, need to be to improve the supervision system and to ease the system toward the mental health. And fourth is to uh, have a priority to listen to health professional needs in order to support and to increase more and more. And last, actually, I have to say that there will not be health without mental health and everyone is entitled to an environment that promotes health, well-being and dignity. So thank you. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Istra, for this very, very beneficial presentation. I think I speak for the whole group and our beloved participants. I'm sure we as international community got a lot of more insights from the presentation of yours and Dr. Yasser in this part two. So a round of applause, please, to Dr. Isra's wonderful and excellent work. And inshallah, we will provide all of these slides uh, with your permissions. We will, I will ask a panelist afterwards so that you can benefit afterwards as well to read it. And we will also give all the contact details to all the panelists if they want to share them. I know that Dr. Walid shared his email. I also saw that Dr. Omar did it. So we will definitely provide you all with this information so you can uh, have those details. So now we move forward to our last part of the panel discussion, which is part three. And this is more to do uh, what can people do to support the work that professionals are doing in Gaza, filling the gaps and action items. I think this is uh, a lot of the questions that I'm seeing in the chat has to do with this. Uh, so I think that this part will be beneficial for us as an international community to know and get some know-how, how we in the best way as possible can support your work on the field and in the ground. Well, uh, I advance. also heard, could you please uh, mute your microphone? Thank you so much. I, by also Dr. Isra's presentation, you mentioned the four points, which I thought was very beneficial, uh, efforts to improve the supervision uh, and supervision systems, awareness of the stigma. And I think that this stigma is generally a, not only a Palestine, uh, 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 you don't find it only in Palestine, you find it in the whole Ummah and in the whole world. For that fact so this is something we could discuss together as well how can we break the stigma of speaking about mental health i think that it was also relevant uh, with uh, sister Rantia's presentation that sometimes the stigma is real because actually what we are what we think is mental health could be something that is perhaps very eurocentric also you know it's not culturally sensitive or adaptable yeah, please could you mute your microphone everybody who joins please mute your microphone thank you so much we really uh, appreciate your consideration so really, there's so many great things that have been said in the session that could be good to know when it comes to being aware of the stigma, how we can break the stigma in many ways. Also develop uh, 
support to the mental health workers is something you mentioned also, both of you actually, Dr. Yasser and Dr. Isra. So the floor is yours, Dr. Yasser and Dr. Isra. We start with you, Dr. Yasser, to speak a little bit more about filling the gaps and what we can do to support their professional works in Gaza. Welcome, the floor is yours, Dr. Yasser. Thank you very much. Well, what we try to do is, I'll just give you uh, an idea about how we operate immediately or during, uh, an attack like the one that we had, you know. Uh, first, we try to uh, uh, use our toll-free line. You know, we have a toll-free line that people in, in Palestine can call free of charge, whether they call from a mobile phone or from uh, a landline, you know. So we try as much as possible to uh, keep our uh, uh, psychologists connected to that toll-free line, and we try to answer as many phone calls as possible. So this is one thing that we, that it's almost the only thing that we can do when there is an attack during the attack times. The other thing that we do is to, like we announce the uh, uh, mobile numbers of our psychologists, of our therapists. So people who are there, like let me say their clients, their patients, they can call them uh, uh, directly. So this is the only thing that we can do during the attacks. But later after the attacks, we work at three different levels. The first level is to uh, uh, try to reach out, to reach the community, to reach the people. We usually start with the most affected people. That could be families of the people who were killed. That could be people who are at the hospitals, the injured people, families of the injured people, or people who were in the mostly uh, uh, heavily attacked areas. You know, And for that, we have, we have teams of psychologists, usually a, a man and a woman, who go and knock the door and visit people and try to provide psychological first aid, detect cases in need for further assessment intervention, and then either refer them to our community center or ask them to call our toll-free line. So this is one level is to, to increase availability of the service and accessibility to the people who are in need. The second one is to try to provide the stress management and care for caregivers. And this comes to more than one level. One level is, for example, people who were like emergency, uh, uh, medical first aid, ambulance uh, uh, workers, you know, all of those people will come really out of the, uh, uh, after the offensive win with huge need for some kind of stress management. So we try to apply as much as possible of, by our own staff, those stress management, um, let me say, uh, uh, interventions. And usually that, is an introductory to care for caregivers. Care for caregivers or supervision is something that we offer to uh, people who work with patients uh, uh, at large. And we usually do that in cooperation with the main stakeholders in, in, in Gaza. Strip. And then at the third level, we try to increase our capacity to, to, to accept uh, uh, clients, to accept people who call us. And this is the most challenging part of it. As I said previously, you know, we have about 3,500 psychologists who are like new graduates or people who have graduated during the last maybe five to 10 years. None of them really has access to, to our workplace. So what we are trying to do is, is that we try to, to, to raise some funds in order to get more human resources. Uh, for example, our initial plan now to, to, to cover the immediate, uh, uh, let me say, consequences after the recent attack is to be able to, to hire at least 50 people. This will be people, like more than half of them, about 35, will try to visit the community as much as possible. The other people will try to be uh, available in the community centers. Uh, so what we are trying to do is to do something like this and something like that in order to increase accessibility to the people and another very important part of it, which is a big psychoeducation campaign because a lot of the population, a lot of the parents did not know, understand why their children behavior started to become different. You know, a lot of people due to the stigma, but also due to the lack of awareness, you know, and understanding they need to be educated. And this is something that we do through radio spots, through uh, TV programs, through uh, social media, our own Facebook website, you know, and we try to educate the population about the, you know, some kinds of uh, uh, symptoms, behaviors that not clearly linked with the with the trauma, but they need, you need to educate them. We we have like you know uh, after the 2014 attack, about 11 or 12 percent of the children who were presented to GCHP were presented with bedwetting. You know, there were another 
people with, with children with problems of concentration. But usually parents are not aware that that bedwetting is a problem that is related to the, uh, to the trauma, for example. So, so the question is how we can, we, we can help. Uh, one of the uh, issues that people in the international community try to talk about is to offer uh, some online support, which means talk directly to the, to, to the victims, to the population. Well, this is something that we totally do not really advise for, for more than one reason. One reason of it is that um, uh, the, the conditions in Gaza are very unique, very exceptional. So unless the, the caller knows really what to do, then they shouldn't really provide call because they might, you know, not intentionally, but they might cause some harm to the people who, who are on the other, you know, call. I mean, Palestinians who are really talking to them. The other thing is that um, from our notes, you know, the... the uh, 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 telephone counseling are people here in Gaza are very skeptic about it for for various reasons. You know, some of the reasons are really crazy. You know, some of the uh, events that happened during that attacks were crazy. So, for example, a mother would receive a phone call and then someone is asking, "Where is your son? Is he at home?" "Yes, he is at home." And then a few minutes later, the home is bombed, the flat is bombed. You know, so there are some some skepticism. And then there was a a, a report about. Uh, 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 the uh, Palestine Relief uh, Medical Society, whose phone numbers were compromised, and suddenly it was their phone number. But I mean, but they were not the ones who were calling. You know, and the questions were about whether Israel was really using their phone numbers to to reach to people. So this is this this makes a lot of the people worried about really accepting international uh, uh, phone call phone calls however on the other hand there are other methods or other ways of helping people one is to uh, connect to the uh, health workers themselves and to support the health workers whether those are mental health professionals or they are they are uh, 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 just simple health care providers people who were just uh, driving emergency uh, uh, let me say uh, uh, cars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those people, of course, they are in, in massive need, and it's, it might be easier to connect uh, with them. The other part of it, when it comes to training, you know, GCMHP used to train in the last five years, about or seven years, about 500 people annually on psychological first uh, uh, aid. So, such simple training we have the capacity to, to provide that. However, they, these kinds of activities need resources not only resources to train people, I speak of financial resources, but resources that would help them go and apply what they have learned. You know, What's the benefit of training 500 psychologists out of the 3,500 psychologists and then not giving them means to go around and help the people who are in need? And then that, the, 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 the other way to help is to provide some specific training. You know, Let me say, I would say, uh, trainings that are not uh, 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 very, very basic level training. We need specific training, for example, uh, CBT for, for tr patients with PTSD, you know, or CBT for patients with uh, depression. You might find a lot of people who are interested to attend such a training. So, so there is uh, 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 three main ways of helping. First, get in connection with the uh, 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 staff on the ground, try to make meetings with them and through them, you can perhaps find means to reach the uh, uh, clients in need for help. The second one, to offer training, but not the very basic and simple one. It should be advanced training uh, modules. And uh, the third one, which is to, uh, to try somehow to spread the knowledge, to try to raise funds for those who work in, in the field. And then there are two other things that we always need to, to think about, which is speak to your community members, try to make a change try to make a change, speak about Palestine, speak about Gaza. There is an, 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 a necessity to end the root cause of everything that happens around us, which is, which is the occupation. So please be active in the community, be active when you speak to your you know, uh, representatives, et cetera, et cetera, and, and try to make uh, uh, a change. And, uh, and then keep us all the time in your thoughts, keep us all the time in your prayers, you know, and do not, give up hope on, on us, you know, we, we are struggling, we are doing our best, we are helping, helping as many people as possible. Uh, and from your side, we expect you also to keep being in touch. So, so this is an, an engineer, thank you very much. Jazakallah khairan, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yasser, for very concrete 
concrete thoughts on how we could help your work, your organization's work, and all of our great practitioners on the field. Please, uh, beloved brothers and sisters, participants, round of applause for Dr. Yasser. For me personally, this has um, this is very beneficial. I think it is for all of our brothers and sisters, an excellent brothers and sisters. Actually, we have an idea at ISIP to and al balkhi to create a pamphlet where we can put all of these points that Dr. Yasser is saying and spread it in our social medias and in our WhatsApp groups so that people really can see, you know, this is how we can do. And in the Q&As, we will speak more because there's a lot of questions. How can we spend, send money to your work? How we can give sadaqah? Uh, so there's a lot of questions. So maybe we can also discuss this. But thank you, Dr. Yasser. Very concrete, very beneficial, very important for us to know. Jazakallah khairan. So we go now to Dr. Isra, just for you to also give some thoughts regarding filling the gaps. The, the, the floor is yours, welcome. Yeah, okay. Actually, Dr. Isra took a very informative, actually recommendation information. I will not add a lot uh, on his talk. Um, in addition to my recommendation I gave you uh, in the presentation, actually I will, I will say that going or concentrating into research uh, either um, in Palestine or outside Palestine, concentrating in mental health research can be very uh, beneficial by increasing the uh, information and research clubs and so on. That's the first point for me. The second point actually to be more aware about the opportunities of um, psychology and how we can um, we can talk how we can go into masters and PhD. For example, increasing the war studies, uh, war and psychiatry. Uh, in addition, uh, increasing uh, the opportunities for child and adolescent psychiatry. Because I, as I said, that there is on, only a one a child and adolescent psychiatrist in Palestine, and how many child are affected and traumatized in in wars and not in wars actually okay so that's the second point uh, for me and the third point and the last point as we said always to increase awareness in a healthcare system and in a community at all by by make the entrance to mental health information and um and actually to erase this stigma by make it make it easy Okay, make the entrance to mental health idea more easy to, uh, for, uh, to citizens and all the uh, population. Okay, so that's the point and I hope this going well. Jazakallah khairan, thank you so much, Dr. Isra. And a round of applause, thank you for concretizing and adding to the points that Dr. Yeser mentioned. Thank you so much, very beneficial. I think that all of the participants and all the brothers and sisters uh, really feel that as well. So thank you so much. So last but not least, Dr. Uh, Sister Rantia, Ustara Rantia, if you could also do a closure regarding this filling the gap and how we can as international community support the works that you are doing on the field. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you. And I would like to personally thank uh, Dr. Yasser and Dr. Estra, um um, having this perspective from the grounds in Gaza is, uh, even for me as Palestinian in Ramallah, is, it was very eye-opening. Um, so thank you. So I will take, I'm going to answer this uh, question from a very, very different uh, perspective. I think before asking this question to someone who is under an oppressive system and colonialist system is that this, uh, this question should be asked to yourselves, meaning, ask yourselves, um, what can I really do? Did, did I read, educate myself on this situation? Are you listening to our voices? What is your role in your own life in supporting this people, your day-to-day -day actions? But most importantly, the question that should be asked to yourself is why? Why do you want to support this cause? Why now? Because we are definitely tired of being asked, how can we be supported since we are been answering this question for many years? Because personally, for me, I cannot separate the white savior mentality complexity from this question. It holds a reflection of the power dynamics and privilege. And I don't mean that one should feel guilty about having this privilege, no. But more, it's more about using it positively rather than shifting the responsibility of action to the oppressed people. 
Because from our own personal experience, this support is only brought up when the media covers the violence against our people. It is only when the survivor guilt complexity is at its highest level, which is mainly when people are being attacked and killed. But afterwards, it's diminished and barely seen and barely heard. And that embodies what I mentioned before, the continuity of reducing mental health and solidarity to only violence. It's, it's treating the Palestinian cause as a humanitarian crisis, which should be stopped. By default, a crisis definition means it's sudden and temporarily. In this case, <clears throat> where it's, it's a case where all hands are needed for temporary relief of the people affected or for rebuilding a stable future. But for the Palestinian cause and the context, this is not the case. It's a violent apartheid colonialist system that has been ongoing and growing more viciously for over 73 years now. So when supporting any cause, check yourself if you're doing this to make yourself feel better and more active, or is it purely for the people? Because the latter means mostly listening and fighting quietly when no one is looking or pointing a camera at you. So we need to rephrase and reconsider our actions. By default, our words will shift as well. And then the solidarity will be turned into a solid support system for the people. We need continuity of solidarity. We don't need shifts. We don't need a trending solidarity. We need a continuity. So like Dr. Yasser said, it's to put pressure on the governments in the community to keep talking about it. So keep going, keep talking because your solidarity and words do have major effects on our mentality and energy to keep going. Your words matter, your solidarity matters, but we need to hear it continually. We know we are not alone when we listen to you, when we hear you, even from far, far away. So keep going and continue, 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 because you matter in our cause, because Palestine and what's happening is not separate from your own life. Continue, continue, continue. Thank you. MashaAllah, 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 Barakallah Fikum, Jazakallah Khairan, Ustara, Sister. A round of applause. I think that was a good summary to tell you, Asal. Let me just... And really, it's, uh, as you say, we need to check ourselves, of course, of course. Allah. There is a lot of... There is a lot of savior complex, as you say. This is an interesting terminology. And, and I think that we need to definitely check ourselves, our privileges. But, and, and as you say, use our privileges to support the cause, of course. Because, alhamdulillah, if, if there is privileges, if there is some powers that the international community has, alhamdulillah, to use that to really benefit your works and support. And as you say, 73 years, it's a long time. It's a long time. And you're using words like apartheid system, colonialism, which is actually the right framing to do. Unfortunately, the, the majority narrative, the international narrative generally is something else, which is not the reality. And these narratives are ingrained in, as you say, colonial attitudes, colonial perspectives. So that's why it's so important to decolonialize the narratives and generally our psyche and our minds. This is actually part of our works as ISIP. We want to be part of this and also to use uh, indigenous, in our case, Islamic, but it could be other indigenous tools to really uh, help with the uh, empowerment and to, 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 to liberate our minds. You know, this is important as well. So thank you so much. I, uh, I really appreciate it. I think I speak for the whole participants. Thank you, Ustara uh, Rantia. So there's a lot of things going on now. And uh, now it's, um, we're in the uh, timings of the Q&As. So I know a lot of the participants are excited to ask questions. And before that, we want to give all the panelists and keynote speakers 30 seconds each, just to summarize uh, the discussions today and if they want to say something else. So we start with the keynote speakers and then we go to the panelists. So Dr. Omar Rida, 30 seconds, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum, jazakallah khair. I mean, um... It's really wonderful that the work that's done on the ground. And I was familiar with uh, how um, high of quality our colleagues on the ground are. So um, I, I don't think we need to really um, think of the basic interventions, mashallah. They have everything covered uh, locally and they know the context. So I, I believe we need to follow their lead, inshallah, and support the efforts and listen to them rather than come and try to dictate our own ideas. So I uh, totally agree with the, inshallah, supporting the local organizations and 
and the, I know everybody has high, you know, good intentions and they want to help Palestine. You help the local people by listening to them. Thank you so much for that summary, Dr. Omar. Always an honor to listen to you. Jazakallah khairan. A round of applause to our beloved Dr. Omar. Uh, and we go, uh, we go next to uh, Dr. Walid. 30 seconds, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I really would like to thank uh, everybody working in Gaza and providing uh, the best care they can. But I would like to send a message to our friends and uh, brothers and sisters everywhere in the world. We have to keep the Palestinian issue going on. And I would suggest that every Friday, after the Friday prayer, there should be demonstration everywhere in the world by under the title Free Palestine. Not providing online CPT for somebody in, in Gaza. That uh, can be handled by Palestinians inside and outside. But the international support, especially the political support, will only come with continuous uh, public uh, demonstration uh, by Muslims, non-Muslims, everybody who can understand the Palestinian situation and uh, cannot accept the fact that this, uh, this land and these people have the right to live as everybody else. And some group who have collected themselves from all parts of the world call, call themselves Israel and occupied this land. And going on with their occupation and going on with the destruction of everything the Pal Palestine has, I think this is uh, quite high on top of the list. And I'm sure everyone in his community, in his country, in his city could do something even very symbolic, but that will, uh, will collectively work. Plus the fact that you are all here and supporting uh, the Palestine, that's great, but we want it in the street and for the politician to hear it. Thank you. Barakallah feekum, jazakallah khairan. Dr. Wali, thank you so much for this great summary and thoughts. Round of applause. Very honored to have you with us, mashallah. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's move to the panelists. So we start 30 minutes, 30 seconds to Dr. Yasser for a summary. The floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Jazakallah khairan. This is uh, actually wonderful to see all of those people uh, participating. And uh, I hope that uh, really I, I haven't disappointed some of the uh, brothers and sisters by saying that, uh, you know, we need something that is more advanced, but that's the reality actually on the ground, you know. Uh, we have uh, the most intellectual people actually on, on the planet. We have the highest number of educated people uh, uh, within a population in, in Palestine. The highest that have master's degree, the highest that have PhD degree when it comes as, as you know, as a... Uh, percentage to the total population, but uh, what we need, we need, uh, uh, we need uh, attention to be paid to the mental health sector. You know, uh, as uh, 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 the panelists say, that uh, uh, it's, it's less than two percent of the uh, uh, budget that goes to health goes to mental health. This is really such a shame in a place like like Palestine. You know, when you know that everyone is really affected. Uh, one way or the other psychologically. Uh, we ask our uh, people who are our friends and our brothers and, and our sisters again to uh, think of, uh, of more advanced level of intervention. You know, we speak about uh, taking care of the people who work here, whether scientifically, you know, uh, whether academically, whether research, you know, uh, or to provide care uh, uh, for them. And if you find that there is nothing that you can do, of course, you can donate, you can support, you can help. Or you can just pray, you, know, you can make dua for us and, and, uh, and try to be active and talk to other people. There are many ways of supporting and you yourself 
being where you are, you can really think of very uh, 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 creative means and ways of supporting the work that we are doing. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khaira. Thank you so much, dear uh, Dr. Yasser. Mashallah, round of applause. We really appreciate all of your thoughts and the summary it was very beneficial. It's such an honor to be in touch with you, by the way. We really, really appreciate everything you're doing. May Allah always grant you and your products tawfiq. Uh, may Allah bless you. So we go to our uh, two final panelists, Ustada Rantia, Sister Rantia, 30, sem 30 second summary. The floor is yours. Welcome. Hey. Hi. So, um... I don't really have a very specific summary as much as I would like to highlight how beautiful this discussion is here and today. And the people from all around the world listening and learning from each other. And yes, our reality is very grim, but our resilience is so powerful. In the beauty of solidarity here gives hope to a brighter future. So thank you to each panelist here today and for their powerful input and discussion and thoughts and experience. And thank you for every attendee here um, with us today as well uh, for the solidarity you are seen and you are appreciated. And thank you, Sayed, uh, for, for organizing all of this and coordinating for all of this. So I just would like to thank you and just to highlight the the beautiful solidarity that we are um, gathering here today for a very long time and hopefully for a, a better effect and a better future. Jazakallah khairan, Ustara Rantia. The honor is ours, really. It's our duty and pleasure to be with you. And thank you so much for a lot of the insights you gave to all of us with your excellent speech and uh, this uh, reflections. Thank you so much. Round of applause to Sister uh, Ustara Rantia. Please, dear brothers and sisters. And, distinguished participants. And last but not least, uh, uh, 30 seconds for a summary from uh, dear Dr. Isra. Uh, the floor is yours, welcome. Okay, um, actually, thank you all for this opportunity. It was very great for me. It, actually, it's my first opportunity entering and understanding the mental health here in Palestine. And it was great. Thank you all for listening. And I hope uh, I was a soft and uh, a good host. And I hope he, we, we can cooperate all and do something, inshallah. And... Mashallah, it was amazing. You were amazing. So definitely we appreciate all of your service. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Isra. Round of applause to uh, dear Dr. Isra for her very beneficial uh, presentation. And I speak for all of us that we are very honored to have all of you. So now we open up for the Q and A's. We are, you know, we already been past our deadline, but okay, for us is okay. If you need to leave, I totally understand. But if you want to be with us a little bit more, it will be uh, an honor. So we'll do some Q and A's and then we summarize. So I already seen a lot of discussions in the chat and my, also want to give a lot of respect and props and uh, show all the appreciation to my dear colleagues, Sister Madiha and Sister Dina. Please round of applause to them. They've been uh, moderating the chat and they're doing an amazing job. So it's, it's really thanks to them that we are here. So Dr. Uh, Sister Dina and Sister Madiha, thank you for your service, mashallah. They have located all of the questions. I will now ask them to the panel. And once more, dear brothers and sisters and participants, you're, you're mashallah so knowledgeable in the in the participants and you want to you know do khidma and do good and to serve so round of applause to all of you who join us today it's amazing and we have a lot of excellent scholars practitioners students and lay persons and just people want to show solidarity in the group i know some of you and you're doing an amazing job thank you so let's see here we have some questions here so how can we join isip just uh, join our whatsapp group as sister dina has put there and then we can give you more information inshallah it will be an honor to have you all as part of our movement and organization uh, one sister is asking can we provide online mental health service from indonesia i think that we got an answer for that but dr yasser you gave some messiah regarding that would you like to answer that question Yeah, uh, again, given the, uh, as I said, the, the, the complexity of the conditions in Gaza, I really wouldn't advise that, but I think we can uh, 
try to link some of the colleagues who want to, uh, uh, let me say, be in direct contact with some of the people who are working on the ground here. That, that might work. We will discuss that. Actually, we have some ideas of how we can move forward. So before we end the session, we can come with some suggestions as well. Uh, thank you so much for answering that question. Um, and then it was also trained psychological first aid for volunteers there, training. So how can the international community support with training? Maybe this question is also addressed to you, Dr. Yasser, mainly. Yes, again, uh, uh, psychological first aid, we have many people who can deliver the training here in Gaza, but uh, I think the, the, the chance is always there for a more advanced types of training. You know, we don't have a postgraduate, let me say, uh, uh, skill capacities in, in specific training programs and specific therapeutic programs. And that's why we do that through uh, uh, international experts. So that, that there is a chance for such training. Thank you for that answer. Then we have, okay, that is the same question. Uh, one question is what interventions are there currently in respect of psychological health? I think that question has been answered. Um, so let us go move forward. It seems like the Palestinian demographic is quite homogeneous. Would like to know how the interventions provided are targeted and if they are preventive or de developmental in nature. Who would like to answer that, dear panel? And this guy is good. Huh? Okay. The Yes, Dr. Yasser, please unmute your microphone. Yeah, the, the answer is a, a little bit complicated. You know, we, we are under, the, all in, in Palestine are under the, the occupation. So, but the, the, the differences are different on the type of uh, uh, traumas that we are exposed to, you know. Like within Gaza Strip, you feel f free, but it's a big open air prison, you know. So it's and uh, in, in, in somehow better than the West Bank when you have a checkpoint every between every uh, city and the other one. But uh, at the same time, we cannot leave Gaza Strip while perhaps in the West Bank it's easier to leave. You know, there, there are some differences, but in, in, in all things are pretty similar one way or the, uh, uh, or the other. Uh, the uh, interventions are at both levels, unfortunately, humanitarian or crisis response that keeps happening all every now and then. And then of course we have that developmental aspect of it, which is like the training that we deliver, the training that we receive, for example, you know, and, and the research work that we are doing. Perfect, thank you so much for that clarification, Dr. Yasser. So let's move forward. And by the way, dear brothers and sisters, an excellent participant, we won't be able to take the questions uh, live with the microphone uh, due to time and due to also uh, efficiency. Please forgive us and, and our sincere apologies, but I think this is what we spoke with the panelists also regarding this, and this, this is the best way to do it. So if you have a question, please send them in the Zoom chat. Thank you for your consideration. So there is a question here to the panelists and to the keynote speakers. I want to ask a question for undergraduate students like me. What can we do for Palestinian brothers and sisters? We are not qualified to make therapy, but we want to do something for them. What do Ustads and Ustadas advise us? So maybe that is a question that already has been addressed, right? I think that the last um, part of the panel, which was how can we fill the gap, answer that question. Is there something else you want to add? Uh, dear panelists and keynote speakers to that question. Hmm. It seems like you were very clear. Uh, so I'll ask another question. Uh, Sister Rantia, this question is uh, addressed to you. Do you, have your re do you have your redefinition of mental health in written form maybe? Um, not, I do have it. I'm trying to um, edit the uh, article and publish it uh, soon, but it's also from my own personal uh, experience and analysis of the situation. So, 
Okay, thank you so much. So when you have released it, we will spread it in all of our networks, inshallah, and in our WhatsApp groups for resource sharing. Barakallah fikum. We are looking forward for that, inshallah. There is a question here, maybe a bit of a strange question, but with all the psychology students in Gaza without a place to work, what can we do for them? Perhaps this is to you, Dr. Yasser. Uh, two, two levels. One is to uh, advocate for more interest in mental health, especially in, 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 uh, in, in Palestine at large, in Gaza in specific. Uh, the other one is to support uh, the organizations. There are some organizations that work on the ground in the field. If you can raise funds for those organizations, that will be wonderful. Uh, one of them is GCMHP, but you can also look for another organizations. You can also contact, uh, I think, uh, uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Slaughter is still here, but the Gaza Mental Health Foundation, they have uh, some connection to some organizations that work on the ground, you know. Uh, because again, they, they need to have means, transportation means to, to just to operate, to work, to go, to you know to give some gifts to the people that they visit, you know, on average, we have five children per family. So when we go, actually, we, we go with some packages with, with some gifts, you know. So there is a need to, to, to provide some financial support one way or the, or the other. There is actually, thank you so much, Dr. Yasser, Jazakallah. There is a question connected to that. How can we send financial support? Well, well, there are uh, different uh, means. We, for example, uh, I work with an organization that is a national uh, non-governmental organization. We, we have uh, any entity that can raise funds, then they can, for example, uh, uh, transfer that donation to the organization, to the organization bank account. And that would be simply uh, against the receipt voucher that will show how the amount and then uh, some sort of agreement on what means you would like to support the work that we are doing. If you are interested in something specific or if you are like just interested in supporting our um, annual action plan. You know? so, so these are the very simple uh, ways of doing it. But there should be an organization that could raise uh, uh, funds on behalf of GCHP because in, in Gaza and in Palestine at large, this is something silly, but PayPal doesn't work, unfortunately. You know? doesn't work at all. So, so that's why we need uh, an organization. You know. If ISIP, for example, can raise funds, you know, and then that fund can come to GCHP, that's fine. And as organization, we receive funds from, from different countries in the world. So you do not need to worry between uh, brackets about sending donation to the organization because we receive from, from, from Norway, Switzerland, Sweden, uh, Germany, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, United States, you know, from, from whatever country you could imagine, you know, so, so there shouldn't be really a, a problem with that. Barakallah That's very good to hear, Dr. Yasser, and uh, Brother Bill has put uh, the link to your website, also gazamentalhealth.org, I think, or it's maybe another website, but still it's a very great website as well. Definitely, we will try to see how we can find ways to support so before we end the meeting, we will tell you a little bit how we can move forward uh, to the participants. But definitely, thank you. And um, uh, Dr. Yasser's organization is a great organization to support really as an international community. It will be an honor for us to be part of that support team, inshallah. Thank so you. let's, I will take a couple of questions more. There is, um, uh, please, Dr. Antia, don't forget to share your speech. Yes, we will share the speech today. Uh, so this, uh, we have been recording the session today. Dear brothers and sisters, an excellent uh, panelist and uh, participants, and we will uh, upload it on our YouTube channel. And if you just join our WhatsApp group, we will share it there so you can see. Uh, inshallah, this will be in a couple of days. Uh, would, would it be possible if to do online sessions with clients from other countries as a means to earn some income. I mean, there's a high demand for Islamic psychology, but almost no proper offering. It could be provided from income for people in Gaza. This is a very good idea, by the way. So this is something we could like discuss how uh, Gaza professionals could also earn money like that. This interesting uh, point of view. So this is just a suggestion uh, and why, why not uh, uh, to provide more work, maybe professionals there uh, but I think first and foremost, maybe the professionals they should work with the Gaza people because it's only 200 for 2 million. So, I mean, 
But I understand the question. It's about how can we support to create a job opportunity. So it's a very good intention in the question. Uh, but maybe we can also find ways to support so that the Gaza professionals can work with the Gaza people because they need it more than many others, of course. So, but good question. I will let that be as a reflection from that participant. Thank you for the reflection. Um, uh, shall we post links here? Sure, okay. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Yasser, I want to get in touch with you regarding Acceptance and Commitment Therapy Act. We are collaborating with Al Belch Institute and ISAB to provide free attendance and training to at least 50 health, mental health providers. This is for my colleague, Ustad Ahmed, mashallah. May Allah bless you. So Ustad Ahmed works with ACT, which is Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and he's offering to educate. So Dr. Yasser, this is an offering uh, to you and your colleagues. Inshallah, we will connect uh, uh, Ustad Ahmed with you. Is a mashallah from Turkey, very, very knowledgeable, very active. We are very honored to work with him as, him as a colleague and advisor. So thank you. I will let that be as a, and uh, Ustad Ahmed wants us to take a screenshot. Inshallah, we will do that before we end to show advocacy. Uh, this is very good uh, to you do, uh, definitely. All right. How can we overcome language barrier in helping work? This is a one that you addressed actually, Dr. Yasser. You said that one problem is if you want to get telecounseling, it's not only language barriers. You can even speak Arabic and live in another country and don't understand that local context you mentioned. Do you want to say something more about that with language barriers or? Yeah, well, the main thing is if, if I could frame it in this way, you know, I, I really try to be sensitive because I don't want to disappoint anyone. You know, I don't want to turn anyone uh, 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 around, but uh, but actually, I need to be frank and honest. You know that that's why we ensure that your efforts are really helpful. Uh, you know, for for a person who lives in Gaza who is now in dire need for, for example, for some kind of psychological support, it will be important to him to receive that support rather than to explain how are things you know happening, why it's happening this way, why it's not happening that way, you know, etc. 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 So so that's why. Uh, we say that uh, the, the help should all the time come from people who are really aware of how conditions are on the ground, who will spend time immediately or directly offering help rather than asking questions about our things and our uh, things on the ground. So that's why we think that uh, the language could be a barrier, but also the different context could be a barrier, you know. Uh, not understanding what's happening around in Gaza could be a, ba a barrier. I, I felt myself a uh, little bit offended one 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 <laughs> evening like it was a couple of weeks ago when uh, a group of people i was talking with them on how to best help and they were talking about uh, 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 a group that could be for example a clubhouse you know and, and that's something that i, I thought well what, what could i tell people who who are skeptic about calling our toll free line if you tell them go and download Clubhouse and try to connect with the international community and find that uh, group here or there and then start talking to them, you know. So it's a little bit, uh, people are honestly trying their best to help, but sometimes it's it's not that best kind of uh, uh, of help and of support, you know. Again, as, as everyone is saying, uh, talk uh, louder, keep us in, 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 in your minds and in, in your prayers, you know. You know, even Dr. Omar said, for example, that psychological first aid wouldn't be enough in Gaza, and I totally agree with him on that point. That's why they, they, it's like the, the door opener, you know, psychological first aid, but when you visit, then you start with the basic counseling, you know, you, you, you look at the symptoms and you start to think what would be the problem, and then you try to begin some sort of intervention to refer them to the best service that is available. So, but but it's easier to say that we are performing psychological first aid than to go into more details to, uh, of that. So so this is in, uh, uh, in short. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Yasser. Thank you so much for that clarification. We really appreciate it. This will be the last question. And it's actually a question regarding also, I think the religious aspect of it. So. Somebody is writing, suicide attempts are a constant rise in our valley. If somebody commits suicide, how do you combine the notion suicide at the same time it's haram, but at the same time it is also the result of extreme severe depression? I want to also address this question to you, Dr. Omar, uh, regarding this, as I know you're very knowledgeable also. And of course, uh, Dr. Yasser, Dr. Walid, Sister Antia, and Dr. Israfil Fritz also. I may quote.
comment on that. Yeah, yeah, please, Dr. Bolli. In previous uh, study for the International Federation of uh, Medical Islamic Society, I have uh, done uh, some research with the professor of fiqh, and the uh, answer to this, if somebody killed himself because of mental illness and is distorted, distorted uh, image of the future and life, he's not considered to be sinful in, in any way. It's only sinful if the, if the person is like a drug addict, alcoholic, and uh, not really uh, doing it on the, from severe uh, melancholic depression or uh, schizophrenia or whatever. And the answer was clear by several examples. And this, uh, uh, these examples were clearly stated. Uh, so for the majority of cases, uh, the, the, the scholars of religion would tell you that uh, mental illness uh, is not the man with mental illness is not responsible and cannot be blamed. And you just you deal with him as usual, pray on his funeral and uh, the, the, the dua and so on as, uh, as everybody else. Jazakallah khairan for the clarification, Dr. Walid. And thank you for uh, doing that research and speaking with the with the ulama regarding that as well. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khairan, very beneficial. It was Brother Adil from Kashmir who asked it, by the way. Actually, there is one doctor uh, in the participant field here who is from Gaza as well. Uh, we are about to end the meeting, but I would like to actually let him have 30 seconds. He's writing, Dr. Imam Faraj Allah. He is doing psychological work in Gaza and is born and raised in Gaza, lives in US, but his whole family is in Gaza. So Dr. Iman, uh, 30 seconds, one minute, please. Uh, you can unmute your microphone and just present your work, please. Jazakallah khair. Uh, it's a she, it's not a he, Brother Sayyid. Uh, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Yasser. Uh, me and Dr. Yasser, we know each other very well because mashallah, he helped me in 2016 to conduct the research paper. Um, uh, and the research actually came up to 250 pages with pictures documenting the effect of the war on Gaza in 2014. And alhamdulillah, it's very well received here in the United States. And I advise everybody highly, I send actually the link to everybody if they want to understand what is the impact of the war on Gaza from the participants um, of the research, the victims themselves, please go ahead and read that research. Um, that is a qualitative research that basically was conducted with the children in Gaza and um, is basically talks about their stories. These kids are actually were hurt, um, you know, physically, like a lot of them, they lost their lungs, their sights, um, uh, and and, and um, at the same time, they are psychologically impacted. Some of them, they lost their father, mother, all these um, issues. I, I think if you read the research, is you're gonna be like sort of heartbreaking. Um, on the other thing I wanted to say, I know that we all like, and I just want to stress the point that, um, you know, uh, Dr. Yasser has been talking about. We all motivated, we all wanted to, to help in Gaza. We want to do training, we want to do this and that. I want to say to everybody, thank you for that. However, the situation in Gaza is really, really hard. Um, and if you don't understand the cultural, political um, situation in Gaza, even if you are in the West Bank, you're not gonna be able to help. Uh, you, you know, the, the wounds are big, the, the wounds are high and closing these wounds and having a session with someone for one hour and leaving them with their trauma is not easy. Um, therefore, I really want to advocate from here to really help um, organizations like the Dr. Yasser organization and other organizations that in Gaza that are working. One thing we can help with is basically we can train like using our expertise. Like if I am 
expert in trauma, maybe I can train some individuals there. These individuals are field workers, like the ones that um, Dr. Yasser organization use, um, and they work with the people. So um, the, the thing that they really need the most is resources. Resources are very, very limited. Right now I'm doing a BTSD um, a training. And in order for me to conduct that, I have to come up with funding to buy internet, computer, uh, bags, uh, all that stuff. And these guys are really like, uh, some of them are social workers. Some of them, they study psychology, but they don't have the resources. We, we're not talking about big resources. They don't have the basic resources like a computer and internet and all that stuff. So I think the best thing we can do is to support them. They are, mashallah, smart, active, and they know, they know what to do at the same time when they work with the clients up there or with the people of Gaza, then they are, they are not, the clients are not left alone after the session. If there is an activation of the trauma, then they have a place where to go. They know that they can dial an 800 number to seek the assistance. We cannot just like from the United States or Europe, just like have a session and then, then go about our life and hang up the phone and then these guys have no support. Therefore, we, uh, um, organizations like um, you know uh, Gaza program can provide the support when it's needed. When you activate the trauma and in, in one session or two sessions and you turn your back and you walk a, away, the client have a phone to call and say, hey, you know what, I need more help. I need someone to come. And I know that actually um, Dr. Yasser organization, even they do home visits. It's really important. I mean, I was myself, I lived in Gaza and I know how, how bad is the trauma is there. I faced it myself when I went there in 2016, it was worse. And I'm guessing right now, like also in 2021 is the worst it can be. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Iman. Uh, sorry that I said he, of course, is the she. Um, so uh, a round of applause to Dr. Iman. Thank you for taking this uh, time to share your reflections and work. And mashallah, you added a lot of great, great perspectives to the panelists. So thank you. Thank you so much. Next time we will invite you also to the panel. Of course, your perspective and know-how is so important. And please forgive us, Dr. Iman, that we uh, didn't know about your work since before. It's my and our fault. My sincere it's okay. apology. It's, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. We all start somewhere. We mm -hmm. have, I, I published some work also on Gaza that I'm more than, I'm more than happy with the Stanford um, yes. University that yes. I'm more than happy, inshallah, to share. Jazakallah khaira. Jazakallah khaira. Thank you so much. And definitely share, definitely join our groups and share. We would love to see more about your great work. And thank you for your khidman service, dear Dr. Iman. We really appreciate it. Round of applause again, please, everybody. Thank you so much. So with that said, dear brothers and sisters, excellent participants, I want to thank first and foremost our keynote speakers, Dr. Walid and Dr. Omar. I also want to uh, thank our panelists, Dr. Yasser, Ustara Ranti, and Dr. Isra. Round of applause, please. I want to thank my colleagues who have been doing the posters, marketing, also administration today. I want to thank uh, Sister uh, Amna for doing the poster, Sister Fatima Ahmed, one of the co-founders of ISIP, for always doing such a great work. Sister Mediha and Sister Dina for the administration today. Excellent work. I also want to thank all of the participants, beloved brothers and sisters, excellent scholars like Dr. Iman herself and Dr. Ahmed and many other great scholars and all the great students and clinicians and practitioners from all parts of the Ummah. I think we have people from Indonesia, Malaysia until the United States and the whole world. Thank you for joining. Thank you for your great engagement. Thank you for all your great discussions, reflections and questions. Please forgive me personally as a moderator. I'm a person with a lot of error in my character. If I have said anything, done anything, organized anything wrong, all the fault is mine. All the fault is mine. I'm a person without an error. So please forgive me, brothers and sisters. Have, have, and all the good things that we have done is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has nothing to do with us. So my sincere apologies if I have done anything wrong and if we have done anything wrong. Last but not least, I will put my email also in the chat. What we want to do now, because we have so many skills and uh, people that want to do khidma, first, uh, please uh, join the WhatsApp groups for resource sharing. We will also offer the, the recordings and all the contacts to the panelists there. Secondly, uh, some of the panelists have written their contact info, so take them, contact them, 
And there is some sites like the Dr. Yasser site uh, and Facebook, uh, Sister Rantia's Twitter, etc. We will arrange all of this and send it in our groups as well for you to benefit. We will do a pamphlet and take some of the points from Dr. Yasser, uh, Dr. Walid, uh, Dr. Isra, and Sister Rantia. We put it in the pamphlet so you can easily know how you can help and support the best way as possible. Please spread the recordings to all of your networks so more people can benefit from all of the thoughts from our great uh, panelists and um, keynote speaker, including actually Doc, uh, Dr. Iman, who I now see as a keynote speaker and a panelist as well. And uh, last but not least, we are trying to create a, a group. So we are, we are uh, as ISIP, together with al Institute, also we have spoken uh, with some initiatives that's going on already. Dr. Azan, one close uh, colleague of mine from Canada, is starting an initiative where Dr. Isra is part of. So we're trying to unite the initiatives now. So to create a group to see how we united with, you know, whether we are layperson, practitioners, scholars, whether we represent different institutes, or organizations, how can we unite to support all of these things that our panelists and keynote speakers have discussed. So email me if you want to be part of that group, whether it's your organization, your institute, you as a private person, uh, and then we can take it from there. We would love to organize this with other organizations, other initiatives. We see a lot of great organizations in Canada, US, UK, Indonesia, Malaysia, South Africa, uh, the Middle Eastern country. My colleague, Ustad uh, Wissam, did an amazing session last week. We spoke regarding how we can support from the Arab world regarding Palestine, Syria, I think even Yemen and war, war zones. So uh, Ustad Wissam, thank you for your great work and service. So we want to unite initiatives and go together as one uh, to, to really benefit from our initiatives. So all of your initiatives, organizations, there is a sister in US creating a group for advocacy. We know that uh, the Khalid Center has thoughts about this. I spoke with Sheikh Munsef who works there, mashallah, great, great uh, practitioner from, from Canada. So there is really amazing things going on. We see that in UK, I think is Ustada Nasima, uh, a, a mentor of mine who has uh, from the IPA some initiatives, if I'm not mistaken, some lists where they're adding people. Uh, Brother Bill Slaughter, uh, I want to thank you as a solidarity person. You're such an advocate for the people of Gaza. Uh, I want to give a round of applause to Bill, Bill because you've been so active, you know, so many months putting, putting so much efforts. Uh, it's an honor to speak with you really. And round of applause to all of your initiatives organizations. So write to me an email if you want to be part of that. We will try to facilitate that together with my colleagues at ISIP and al Belkhi Institute. And we would love to or, uh, communicate with your organizations, institute, initiatives, work, or whether you're just a private person or a pr practitioner, you're more than welcome. And please join the WhatsApp groups. With that said, I think I haven't forgot anything. Thank you for all the participants, beloved brothers and sisters. It's an honor to be with you. And we'll, let's, we'll finish with a dua, because Dr. Yasser also said that we can be, prayer is a good tool. And, Many of us who are, you know, into the spiritual part of our deen, and may, we would love to do uh, the prayer. So, Dr. Omar, if you can assist us, if you're here, if you could lead a, a prayer for us to finish and to put the barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into this. And before you do, I just want to quote some Quranic verses also regarding solidarity and kinship, which I find so beautiful. So, uh, for instance, in Surah 3, Ayat 103, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us, and hold fast by the covenant of Allah altogether and be not disunited. And remember to the favor of Allah on you when you were enemies, then he united your heart. So by his favor, you became brethren and you were on the brink of a pit of a fire. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. And also another um, uh, from Surah 49, Ayat 10, the believers are but brethren. Therefore, make peace between your brethren and be careful of your duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that mercy may be had on you. So we have so much in our faith that we can use as Muslims. We have a lot of non-Muslims here as well. Thank you for your solidarity. The Palestinian cause has nothing to do with religion. This is a political thing. We need to be very careful. Many Palestinians are Christians. Many people are from other ideology, other faiths or other types of uh, ways of living. So Palestine is not a religious. They want to make it a religious thing. And we as an international community do need to say no to that. This has not, we have a lot of Jewish people around the world supporting the Palestinian cause. People like Gabor Matei, one of the greatest psychologists uh, that are supporting. Uh, we are criticizing Zionism. And there is a lot of Jews that are against Zionism. 
So this has nothing to do with religion. This has nothing to do with ethnicity. This is geopolitical. This is colonial. This is oppression. And we have a lot of Christians supporting the cause. We have a lot of people that are agnostic or which, which, which belief system they have. Of course, we have a lot of Jewish people in the international community. So we want to also emphasize, even though we are ISIP, the International Students of Islamic Psychology, and we do our organizing uh, and rooted in our faith uh, as Muslims, we are very much open to collaborate with other faith groups, of course. We need intercultural dialogue who, and together stand, because even as an Ummah, we come from different parts of the world and there is different cultures. So this is very important as a last message. Please put this advocacy out there. Don't let them distort the narration and the narrative of Palestine. I was in Bethlehem personally, and I met beautiful Palestinian Christians that were suffering of oppression. So he, really the Palestinian cause is really to unite people, unite people. We have Brother Bill here, he's not a Muslim and he's still supporting Palestine as his. As his. So this is solidarity beyond borders. This is solidarity for humanity. And of course, as Muslims, we love our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his teachings is speaking about this uniting the humanity of course so that with that said dr omar please if you could finish with the uh, maybe a recitation from quran and the dua dua please Jazakallah i'm not qualified to make dua but alhamdulillah all of us inshallah we are asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, as he gathered us today to gather us inshallah tomorrow and the Hadra of the Prophet ﷺ in the highest level of paradise. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about uh, Palestine many times in the Quran. He said, Udkhul al al muqaddasa It's a sacred land. He said, Al Masjid al Aqsa ladi barakna hawlahu. There is lots of blessings around Al Masjid al Aqsa. And we hope, inshallah, we get to pray there. So I uh, sure. again echo your words and the words of uh, everybody in the room that uh, we are here because we love Palestine. Inshallah, we will be visiting uh, Gaza and visiting Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa very soon. Barakallahu feekum for everything. Our dream is to do this to Jude together with all our beloved brothers and sisters in Palestine and Al-Aqsa Mosque in the future, inshallah. As a Muslim, we have Palestine in our heart, but also non-Muslims have Palestine in their heart. We see such a compassion from the whole international community. Just wanted to emphasize, inshallah, we will do prayers in the Sujood and Al-Aqsa together. So would you like to recite Surat Al-Asr, please, uh, Dr. Omar? You have such a beautiful voice. Please give us the blessing, please. Surat what? <laughs> Surat Al-Asr. Al-Asr, alhamdulillah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Wal-Asr inna al-insana lafi khusr. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. بارك الله فيكم. Thank you all with those with this beautiful recitation of Surah Al-Asr, which is our Sunnah to to get barakah for meetings and uniting us and to get the blessings from our Lord Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. بارك الله فيكم. From ISIP and Belkhi, we thank all of you, great participants. We wish you a great continuation of your day. And let us keep keep uh, fighting for the Palestinian cause. Thank you to the panelists. I wish you all a great day. Mah salama wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Wa Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasser. Jazakallah khair. Very beneficial. Thank you.